cannibalism for Thanksgiving. That's hot. Soup. Oh, did I just hit myself in the head with a book? <laughs> Little alien girl, why does the colonizer have yellow fever? What is up, y'all? It's your boy Nate. I read books because reading is sexy, and if you're not reading, you're not sexy. First and foremost, I, I want to thank everyone who has left a message on my last video. It truly, truly means a lot. I'm in better spirits. I, I really can't thank you enough for your presence and your words, and it really means a lot. I've read every single message, so thank you. It means a ton. Secondly, I don't know how y'all are just creating these top 10 lists already, because, like, y'all... Uh, do, do, do you see this? We've got a, a bit to talk about, so we're, we're gonna get right to it. As always, these will be flash reviews of the books, and more will be spoken about these books in future vlogs, so stay tuned. But let me do a quick count here. Head count, everybody! Oh my god, I did 18 books in the month of December. I might read another one, there's like two days left of December, y'all. Am I, am I gonna do it? Who knows? It's a Goosebumps book as an ARC. I don't know if I'll get to it. But y'all, let's let's get through this. Ready? Martyr, Kabe Akbar, about a down-and-out guy who has a very traumatic experience and lives through it by visiting a performance artist at the Brooklyn Museum. She's dying of cancer, lives out the last of her days in this museum, and an incredible bond forms. Y'all, the hype is real. Like, this, spoiler alert, if anybody want a spoiler alert, this is ending up in my top 10 list. <sighs> yeah, it's incredible in that it's refreshing the way it views how we tackle life from the perspective of death and how we move through death in ways to create a more wholesome living. Akbar is a poet and you can see the lyricism sing through the prose and it's just so, so gorgeous. So many lines highlighted. This just means so much to me. The time that I read it, it just said so much and meant so much. I am so well. I am so well because of it. Martyr Kabe Akbar. This is out by Kanaf in the new year, January 23rd. Look out for it. It's a good one and it's for the heart. Love it so much. Next up, I read this tiny. Here we go. The Pleasure of the Text. Shall I tag the Pleasures of the Text? Love ya. Love her. Go give her a follow. She's wonderful. This is looking at the text and the difference between pleasure and bliss. Why do we enjoy reading? Why do we love it so much? He dissects that through various texts. Yeah, it's a, it's a quickie. It's a joy. What this feels like is Barth's explaining what sex is to you. And I'll have another book mentioned here, I'll put it up, but it's several short sentences about writing, which I think shows you why we enjoy sex, versus this tells you why and explains it to you. Thinking about it now, I'm not quite sure if I really enjoy Barth's, but this, I think, has a lot in it that if you are a fan of linguistics or just writing in general, a beautiful quick read. Then I did Miami by Joan Didion to keep me from the cold. And this explores the very atmospheric and textural moments of it for the very first few pages. And then sort of the rest of the book, 80% of the book is sort of the political paranoia that Miami becomes, where money goes, where dead bodies follow. And it sort of sets up the political spheres of her fictional works, like Democracy, The Last Thing He Wanted. I think those political thrillers, quote unquote, are derived from her writing of Miami. So if you enjoy her political fiction writing, I think this is a very interesting place to look in sort of the becomings of it. I thought it would be more atmospheric, but in the moments that it is, it's just, of course, Didion, the prose stylist that she is, is written with such great detail. Yeah, and also, God, this cover, love it, love it, love it. Next up, I read Alphabetical Diaries by Sheila Hetty. This is out by FSG February 6th. Y'all, oh my God. <laughs> the way I literally highlighted the entire book 
It's insane. It's a 10 year period and it's a arrangement of sentences from A to Z. And it just reflects on her life, on motherhood. We understand where her novel, The Motherhood, comes from. And it's just everything about relationships, the sex that she's having, wifehood. It's just so, so rich and earnest. And with its experimental form, I think it just works so well. I always feel like Hetty just has these like very gimmicky ways of tackling the novel but they never end up feeling way too gimmicky. They they serve a purpose. And here the purpose is served so wonderfully. And God, I, I love this to death. It's an incredible five stars for me. And I'm a heady stan. What can I say? I love Sheila Hetty. Out by FSG in February, check it out. Next I read Beautyland, also out by FSG, uh, January 16th. This is about little alien girl who is sent to Earth to sort of examine the ongoings of human life. As soon as she gets there, she realizes how much more human she is than she is alien, as she understands girlhood, loss, and eventual womanhood. This one's for the girls. It is so odd. The writing is so weird. Bridge is on twee, and that's okay, because it's just so odd. Just the language that is used is just refreshing adorable and has that like 2008 indies vibe to it. It's just so wonderfully indie and has this very indie spirit that I love so much about it. Weird, beautiful, and sweet. This one's for the girls. Girlies, you out there reading? Please pick this up for 2024. It's joy. Yeah, the last few pages had me tearing up just like, oh, the, the writing just swells and it hits you in all the right emotional beats and it's just so, so good. Uh, trust, trust. Marie, Helen, Bertino, check it out. Next up, I read The Fetishist by Catherine Min. This is out by Putnam Sons, January 9th. Look out for it. It's a posthumous publication backed by Kathy Park Hong and Alexander Chi, but it's about this daughter who seeks revenge after years of rage and grief after her mother's death and explore sort of the tensions and comical situations that arise from Caucasian and Asian relationships. And yeah, why do why does the colonizer have yellow fever? It's a fun one for my for my ABGs out there, for my Asian homegirls. I thought this was fine. I, I feel like there were issues with it because it wasn't finished when it was published posthumously. And I think Min's daughter was trying to have it reach publication but in that i don't think there was enough editing that was happening and it, it just doesn't hit the mark essentially but i still think it's a very interesting voice and min i think is originally a short story writer and i think most of her strength exists in that form so i'll link downstairs a few of her short stories just to get you a feel of what her voice is like because I think it's a it's a very interesting and particular voice that I think is uh, really sad to know that it's gone. I picked this up because of the cover and it's such a fun cover. Next I did a buddy read with Yena Modern Ajima of A Certain Hunger by Chelsea G. Summers. She actually gifted this to me and then went out and bought her own copy and if you read my Goodreads review, which I think I'll have downstairs. Also, ooh, I want to say I am a proud bookshop affiliate. So any of the books mentioned in this video, if you go down to the links downstairs, I will get a little bit of a uh, heart and soul if you purchase the books through the provided links. So if, if you want to help a homeboy out, I'm the homeboy. Yeah, if you read my Goodreads review of this, it's, it's pretty harsh. <laughs> I didn't mean to be so harsh. It was just very much in the moment. And I was just in between like a couple of three star reads. So it's just like, uh, I'm looking for that four star read. Give it to me. Will say, after having watched Saltburn and how something bad can just be fun. This is three stars. Three stars, Certain Hunger. It's about a female Hannibal Lecter who is also a restaurant reviewer and yeah, kills men, eats them, and uh, yeah. It's all told through past recollections and I think that's where it loses uh, most of its steam as sort of the chapters become very repetitive and there just isn't really great interest in how the male characters are fleshed out, although I understand why that may be. It just becomes so boring and I just didn't have a good time with this. 
I came in expecting like the menu, but didn't really get that. But we'll say if there is ever a Hulu adaptation of this, I, I will jump to it because that would be so much fun. Here, no, it's just so overwritten. I think Yana had a actually really good time with this, but yeah, this is girl dinner in a pinch. Definitely read this around Thanksgiving. Cannibalism for Thanksgiving, that's hot. Okay, then I had an ARC of Green Dot by Madeline Gray. This is out by Henry Holt & Co. February 27th. This is set in Australia. It's about a 24 year old girl who works this job and then pines over this married man and ends up in a relationship with him. And uh, this is one of the hard three stars that I was um, encountering. This is fine. It's very much of the times and it made me realize like, oh my God, was I really that insufferable at 20? But it's very much like about, yeah, that first great big love. And here it is as a very problematic situationship. What do we do? How do we come out from it? And can we still be a thing that's loved? But yeah, as a debut novel, it still feels debut-y. Grey is one of those writers where you kind of just want to wait until like the second or third book and then it'll be good. Oh, what did I write? I, I wrote the epitome of new adult fiction if Gen Z feels Emily Henry is too millennial. I think that sums it up, honestly. And I'll leave my review at that. Next I read Fernanda Melchor's Hurricane Season. Oh my god, I felt so sick reading this. I started it and by 20 pages in, I was like, I, I want out immediately. There were no paragraph breaks. Melchor was like kind enough to give us short chapters at the beginning. But this is about a witch that dies in a very small town village. This hurricane of hecticness spirals after her death following these very young boys and yeah explores everything that Melchor is very good at doing the psyche and trauma of young men and where their violence stems from where their sexual frustrations stem from and to the very core like who are they well, who are these little kids who are these little boys by the end of it a huge sense of relief this was a lot <laughs> did I feel it was gratuitous no, I think, I think it was perfect, especially in comparison to my recent read of Crash by J.G. Ballard. Everything that J.G. Ballard tried to achieve in that book is much better done here. Yeah, Melchor is just so brilliant in how she was able to create a voice that felt so gossipy, yet crime reportage-esque at the same time. Oof, God. But y'all, not for the faint of heart, will tell you that. It was a banger, though. It was a banger. Next, I read... Disgrace by J.M. Quetzi. Y'all, how? How is this the winner of the Nobel Prize? <laughs> we'll give Quetzi credit. He's an incredible writer. I did not realize how readable this was and how compulsive of a read it was, but I just did not enjoy the male character in this. Like, I had no empathy. No matter how much loss he went through, no matter how much grief he went through, I was just like, no, 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 no. Written in, when was this? 1999. Just how women are described in this book, definitely written from the point of view of a man. I could not get over the objectification of women in this, and I, it just put a bad taste in my mouth. But Quetzi is incredible in his prose, and how readable it is, and how it's for the people. It's about a professor who ends up in a relationship with one of his students, and after he is sort of exiled from the university, he goes back to his lesbian daughter. Yeah, and something very, very traumatic happens and all takes place after apartheid and explores the tensions and safety of South Africa. I thought it was fine. I don't get the, quite the hype that people gave this, but you know, it was 1999, what can you do? Next up I read Zodiac by Ai Weiwei. Yes, that's right. Ai Weiwei has a graphic novel coming out January 30th by 10 Speed Graphic. This is fun, fine. Explores Ai Weiwei's art and sort of his art philosophy and his experiences with police brutality through the different animals of the Zodiac. It's rich in the way that it's sort of drawn and falls into 
dream sequences, playing with past and present, almost feels like Waking Life if anybody's seen that by Linklater. It's a bit heavy-handed at times, and that I understand with the limitations that I think Ai Weiwei wanted to exist in within this form of exploring all the zodiac animals and um, sticking with theme for each animal. It's a quick read. If you want to know more about Ai Weiwei with like really fast basic understanding that isn't a Wikipedia lookup, uh, this is a good place I think to start. Zodiac by Ai Weiwei. Okay, then I read Solo Faces by James Salter. This, I feel like, is a Salter most people don't talk about, and it's about climbing. So it's like, it's not talked about, and it's about something that most people don't talk about. <laughs> Spanning across from America and the French Alps, we have this guy who, yeah, wants to tackle on this giant mountain. And with that, you get usual Salter romance. And what I really admired about this book in particular was just the adventurism that exists within how he is able to carry the excitement and the thrill of being at such great heights. Because usually his prose swells within relationships with people, but here is the relationship with nature that I think is so, so darling and works so well. There are moments where the prose just took my breath away and yeah, you can always count on Salter for good prose writing. If you are a fan of James Salter's work, if you are a fan of climbing, this one, this one has your name written all over it. Oh, do I just hit myself in the head with a book? Then I had an ARC of Root Fractures by Diana Koi Nguyen. This is out by Scribner, January 30th. It is a collection of poems of a very haunting family past and the death of a brother and really focuses on post-Vietnam War using images, poetry itself, and the repetition of the poems and images. And sometimes together there will be poems on pictures. Works the way memory works, and it's beautifully done, straight from the heart, incredible voice that looks at language, how it is playful in both Vietnamese and English. Comes to terms with, or at least I came to terms with, um, being very proud of my heritage and my culture, and yeah, I'm just really glad that we have Vietnamese voices out there, being that I'm Vietnamese, and I'm proud. I'm very proud to be Vietnamese. And yeah, sent my mom a message after having read this. It's just beautifully done, all about the past and how we make sense of it, generation after generation, how we speak about it. Then I read Rave by Renald Gotts. Will say, I went to Boiler Room. <laughs> I did Boiler Room and read this, and y'all, this this did not hit. <laughs> this is about basically what it means to go out, what it means to go clubbing, the drinking, the drugs, just everything. But it's just, it's, it's really boring. It slogs, and there isn't enough cute prose to save it. Not enough interest as well. You're sort of just following these characters as they go from club to club throughout the night, saying a bunch of like pseudo-intellectual stuff, but like there isn't enough interest in all of it until I think... Maybe the third quarter of the book, uh, Gotts sort of learns his footing within his own book, and that's where it gets particularly enjoyable. I think he definitely needed an editor for this, and you know what? If, the, if this was published, I'm gonna go out and publish the great clubbing novel. Like this, I could do... Well, I'm gonna tell you, I can do a lot better than this. That's the review, because honestly it should have been a DNF, and just really disappointed about it. I was sort of doing research about like club life and nightlife, the use of like house music and everything. I was hoping it would help, but uh, it, was, it was okay. Research failed. Then I had an ARC of 10 Bridges I've Burnt, a memoir in verse by Brantes Purnell. This is out by MCD February 13th. It's, yeah, a memoir in prose and it was so much fun. Y'all, Purnell is from Oakland and <laughs> It just made me miss the Bay Area so much. And it's just so, so honest and earnest and just funny, sad, whimsical, beautiful. And it, it's just him. He's definitely that person that you take to brunch and you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll drink too much. And then you'll realize, oh God, it's four in the afternoon. What do I do with the rest of my Sunday? Kind of guy. And 
yeah, it's just so, so good. I read this, I think, in one day, in one sitting, and you should do it. Please do it. It's an absolute joy, but it covers the Black queer experience within the Bay Area. It's very much, I think, yeah, the energy of the city, or what it is now. But yes, so, so good. Check it out. Okay. Then I did Good Behavior by Molly Keane. This is essentially mannerisms within a dysfunctional family, examining that as they plummet themselves further and further into debt. The story begins with uh, soup that ends up killing... Is it soup? I think it's soup. Oh, it's a rabbit moose. Anyway, rabbit moose kills her mom, and then we try to understand why. <laughs> It's fine. I, I think most of the fun exists in Rune's uh, perspective and how she examines the dysfunctions of her family and her picking up like why this happens and why did someone do the thing that they did. And it is very much about the hierarchies of family, the high class society of mannerisms as well, how it all plays out. There's some sexy bits and it's a, it's a good holiday read. I think perfect for Thanksgiving and Christmas as it examines sort of the dysfunctions of family in general. Yeah, but I thought this was fine. I just couldn't get around the pros, and I think it's just a me thing. I don't know what it was. I will say that I think... Ooh, if anybody remembers that Helena DeWitt book, The, the English Understand Wool, I think does a better job of doing what this book tries to achieve, and in so few pages. That book is like 64 pages, y'all. And this thing is like almost 300 pages. Um, is that all the books? Nope. Then I did Last Night at the Lobster by Stuart O'Nan. This is about Manny who works at a Red Lobster that's closing um, a few days before Christmas. But this is, this is about the underdog. This one is for the people who have ever worked a holiday, who did not get a chance to see friends or family, living paycheck to paycheck. This is very much an underdog tale while also dealing with romantic interest at the workplace. It's a cute one, I think perfect for the holidays if you two are working. Read this on your lunch break. It gives greasy dinner tabletops, low dim lighting, dirty snow, assholes on holidays. Very much like I feel like Sedaris's Holidays on Ice, the mall elf story, sort of the same thing. It's sweet, it's funny. It's a bit twee. Um, it's a cute one for Christmas. And then y'all, my last book, my last book of 2023, Eileen Otessa Moshfag. I just finished this like 30 minutes ago. And this is my last Moshfag. And I've read her entire bibliography and this is like crazy to me because it's just like, great, now time to do the Moshfag tier list if anybody wants it. But this was so atmospheric. I loved this so much in that it just gets New England winter so well. It's moody, it's dark, it's dirty, it's disgusting, and all its like Moshfegian ways. Ugh, I just love that it's sort of the ugly version of Carol in that it's not entirely like lesbian, but obsession, obsession drives the book. It's just so wonderfully done. It just builds on atmosphere and you really get a sense of her protagonist, Eileen, where she comes from and who she is and why she is the way that she is. Why she falls head over heels with Rebecca, her coworker, where they work at the same male prison. I still need to think about this. A good four stars. I think because it's so atmospheric, this is like the best winter read. And I, I loved it a lot. I don't think the humor really sings. The humor hums. Coming from McGlue and going into this as her first novel, like her debut, I think she very much worked still within the seriousness of her writing. And then you get to see the humor flesh out itself later in her work. This is like very compulsive read for me. Even though like I read it over the last few days of the year, because I just, I didn't want to finish it. Finishing it is admitting that I've now finished her bibliography. Crazy. Now I just have to wait for a new release. But yeah, loads of fun. Now I can't wait to watch the film. Further thoughts on that later. Y'all, that is, that is it. Yeah, I don't know how y'all did like top 
10 reads yet because I was like, I'm still reading. It's still 2023. Ah! Y'all, all of this, and I am so sorry if I did an awful job because that was a lot of books. <laughs> that was a lot of books for December. I'm just like trying to read everything off my physical shelf. End of the year panic. Y'all, thanks for being here. I will have a top 10 list coming soon. I just wanted to do a December wrap-up because I feel like people don't do December wrap-ups and they they deserve some love, okay? They really do deserve some love. It's just like, it's... It, yeah, yeah. You'll get a top 10 list. It'll come out in January sometime. Yeah, again, y'all, truly, thanks for watching me sit in my butt and talk about books. Like, that's, that's crazy. Let me know what your top read of December was. I love adding books to my TBR. It's a never ending TBR. Wishing you a very good reading year in 2024. That's it y'all. 2023, done and did. It's over. Okay, on that note, be well, do good work, keep in touch.